Good evening, my name is Artemis and I am Speaker of the Regional Assembly of the North Pacific. Today, we have an interesting topics of discussion, some legislation pending in the Regional Assembly, some drama that happened in its chambers, and a ruling from the regional courts about the status of citizenship applications. First up, we're going to talk about some drama that happened in the Regional Assembly since our last broadcast. First off was the recall proposal of Roman Romanoffia from the Security Council. Roman has been a longtime member of the North Pacific and has had an impact on many aspects in, in the culture of TNP. Recently, though, in the past two years, he has not endorsed nations while it's serving as part of the Security Council. McMacedonia introduced a recall motion to remove Roman from the Security Council. Many calls were made to Roman to answer to these, and for a while it seemed like he would not respond. But when he did, fireworks flew. In the end, the motion was taken to a vote, and before the conclusion of the vote, Roman resigned from the Security Council. During this, it raised some many questions on procedures for recalls and how things could have been done differently. It also raised questions of what we expect of members of the Security Council. And these discussions are going on today on ways we can A, reform the recall movement, and ways we can hold not just security counselors, but government officials more accountable? Is there laws that we can pass to make things more, to hold our officials to a higher standard? That brings us into the next um, piece of legislation that's pending before the Regional Assembly, the Recall Reform Act. This was an act proposed by Romanoffia to set a higher standard of sorts for what can be what an official can be recalled for. Currently the laws only state that the RA can recall an official with a two thirds majority vote. That is to say the regional assembly has the authority to recall any official for anything they deem as a recallable offense or an action. The Regional Assembly can recall anyone in a government capacity as long as they meet the required two-thirds majority vote. So during the discussion, it's been said they want to set a higher standard of what a recall can be considered. What can an official be recalled for? Roman wants to set the standard as they've broken some kind of law, they're not meeting their requirements, and he wants the recall to be set where, where the official has violated the law. They wants that cited. Because during his recall attempts, technically he never missed a requirement. His endorsements were above the minimum. His influence was above the minimum. And he maintained citizenship. Those are the three basic requirements of a security counselor. But due to him not endorsing any other nation in two years, endotarding in two years, barely involved in discussions and debates within the Security Council, many felt he wasn't living up to his position and expectations that we have for a Security Counselor. With this, it would say, okay, you may not be happy with that official, but what have they done wrong? Where in the law have they messed up? Personally, I don't see the need for that. All officials are accountable to the electorate, to the citizens, and the citizens hold officials accountable through the regional assembly. So, to place a limit on the powers of the regional assembly in this manner, I, I don't see this moving forward in that manner. I don't see 
the citizens accepting placing a limitation on their power. Because TMP is not going to recall an official just because, oh, they like the color blue. I don't like the color blue, so I'm going to recall them. No. We take recalls extremely seriously. They are a slow-moving process. And many times, many people feel it is very personal to recall an official because we want them to succeed. We want our officials to succeed because if they are succeeding, then that must mean that the regents succeed. And to say, no, you're not succeeding and you're not helping TNP anymore. That's why we need to, that's why we need to go a different direction. And I feel sometimes a recall motion is a wake up, uh, wake up, has a wake up effect on that official. Sometimes it makes them realize, okay, I'm not doing what I set out to do. And I'm not doing what the people of TNP expect of me. And I'm not doing it to the standard that they hold our officials to. So do I fight their recall? Do I resign? Or do I try to do better from now until this goes to vote to show them I am the one for the job? But recalling is a very, is a very personal matter. Because we have to think, am I recalling this person because I don't like them? And I have to think, how do I want to put this into words, what I'm feeling? Recall should not be the first resort for someone not doing their job. It should always be a last resort. And not something that's taken lightly. And I, in TMP, there is not a culture of recalling officials lightly. The last recall I rec- that I remember was the recall of Deropia's Vice Delicate. And that was a very difficult recall for many people. Because many people felt that Dropy had been had done a good job, but he had gone absent. No word to anybody. Just disappeared, and many people were worried about him. And so it made recalling him that much harder. In the end, he was recalled, but still, many today, many people today still reference that and say that was difficult. And. I don't think the Recall Reform Act is needed. I think the citizens of TNP are not going to be con- riled up into a mob that some people think would happen. I don't see that happening with TNP. Maybe that's just me thinking, believing too much in our citizens to take that To not take this seriously and to just call out for somebody's blood. So I don't think the Recall Reform Act is going to be needed. I don't support the recall reform. Probably I would support some procedures within the Regional Assembly that um, further defines the process of the recall and sets a standard for the procedures. From a time of debate to what is needed to call for a vote to the time between the vote was called and the vote actually happens and how long a vote must be. I don't think it's... I think those are some procedures that we need to define to make the process not easier to recall them, but allows us to focus on what the motion's actually about and not have to worry about the actual finagling and political maneuvering in this. So that's something that it's going on in the regional assembly that people can take a look at and should read through and really think through of, is this something we need? Is this going to help TNP or is this just going to protect some people? Those are just some thoughts to have when looking at some legislation. 
so moving on to kind of some lighter notes, um, we had two NPA bills um, come before the Regional Assembly. Uh, one was a, both are kind of a consistency related bills um, regarding the name of the MPA. Legally, the MPA is, uh, is part of the North Pacific Armed Forces, the MPAF. And we have some laws that say MPAF, or the title of an entire uh, chapter of our code is the NPAF, North Pacific Armed Forces. And throughout it, it pretty much references the MPA, not really mentioning the MPAF. Um, the other one is to rename the chapter the MPA and solely refer to the military of the North Pacific as the North Pacific, North Pacific Army. Um, both are relatively low key terms, in my opinion. Um, the MPAF bill proposed by MAJAG uh, made it to being scheduled for a vote before the author removed it. Um, and currently the MPA consistency bill is still before the regional assembly being discussed. Two pretty low key items that have had some interesting conversation going on in them. The next discussion we have is the Vice Delegate Check Efficiency Bill. Um, currently, the Vice Delegate has three days from the time a citizen or a potential citizen makes an application for citizenship. Or, yes. Um, Syl Dorset has brought up the idea of increasing that time or changing the time the, deleg the Vice Delegate has to process security checks. Um, Initially, it was pro proposed along the lines that the vice delegate would be the last of the checks in the series. Um, currently, a citizen has to go through the speaker's check, um, reviewing their oath, making sure they have a nation in, t in making sure they have a nation in TNP. Um, then there's the administrative check, where a forum admin will check. IPs and making sure there's not duplicate accounts. And the vice delegate just ensures that they are, this person is not a known threat uh, to TNP and they're not getting citizenship and access to private areas such as the regional assembly um, and the private discussion areas. So what he's proposed is that the vice delegate be the last of three checks. So once the speaker and the administration have made checks on the individual, the vice delegate will have three days hence to make uh, their check. Um, now, during discussion, it's brought up, why not just increase the time from three days to seven days um, to perform the check? And currently, that's how the bill reads. It's increasing the vice delegate time from three days to seven days. And I think that's a very good... Uh, a good a good move forward um just for reference the administrative team has 14 days to perform an admin check so increasing the vice delegate check to make sure that just this person's not a security threat um they're not a known enemy or ties to known enemies of the north pacific and gives them a little bit more time to evaluate that and consult with the security council uh, finally, on some of our last discussion on pending legislation, we have the Executive Accountability Act and the Ministerial Ethics Law. Um, both of these were written by former Speaker Wondrous. Um, with these have been some interesting bills to read through. Uh, ultimately, the Executive Accountability Act um, initially was going to require each minister to submit a report over a period of time regarding activities within their respective ministry. Um, it's been brought up that ultimately it should be the delegate who makes that report um, because each minister is not technically a required minister. There's only two required ministries, one for foreign affairs and one for internal affairs. Um, so, it's been brought up that potentially we could do, um, that this bill could organize a state of the region address um, once every term or um, twice a term. 
uh, those specifics haven't really been hammered out or moved forward. Uh, the b- author has asked to somewhat pull the bill from consideration while he deliberates on a move forward. And that had led into the ministerial ethics law, which would create a mandatory ministry for uh, ethical review of the government. Um, This has been met with some strong resistance because many feel that the delegate should not appoint the official who's going to basically audit the rest of his government to make sure there's no ethical concerns. Um, this de- this position would also submit reports to the public about the happenings of the government. It's been kind of an interesting topic. I don't think it's needed um, for the most part. The power to hold officials accountable once words of unethical behavior happens is the regional assembly through the recall effort. Um, I think there could potentially be some wiggle room to make the bill more appealing. Perhaps the appointment of a committee from within the regional assembly um, concerned with ethics that would be granted the power to subpoena any records. I don't know. I'm just throwing out some ideas that could potentially be used to make the uh, to reduce any concerns of improper ethics happening in the government or whispers of unethical behavior from happening. So for the most part, that is the summary of most of what's been going on within the regional assembly and the actions that have been happening and the drama that's going on there. Um, As always, we do fully encourage any citizen to submit bills, um, write legislation, be feel free to contact any member of the speaker's office. Um, If you have an idea for legislation, but you don't just don't know how to put that idea into words and craft it into action. Um, We'd be more than happy to help guide your idea into legislation and then hopefully eventually into a law uh, if it gains enough support within the region. So now I want to talk a little bit about the recent court ruling regarding the citizenship applications. So a little backstory. Back in April of... 2018, so almost a year ago, the Regional Assembly passed an amendment to the um, citizenship oath and application process. Um, Before, there was a qualifier along the lines of I, the leader of, and then you would insert your nation, followed by the rest of the oath. Um, was changed to be simply the current oath that it stands as read. Um, There was a few people who felt this was a pretty important change, and ultimately it did pass the Regional Assembly and was signed into law. Um, The issue was, is the consistent, it wasn't consistently enforced, the old oath versus the new oath. The old oath wasn't basically axed. It was still being accepted in conjunction with the new oath um, up until pretty much the start of 2019. The old oath was still being accepted. Um, And towards the beginning of this term, a citizen was denied a position within or was denied as application because he had posted the incorrect oath. Um, He wanted to use a qualifier to identify himself in the oath. And as speaker, I denied that application, um, and which in turn led to a request for review for the court. Um, It's quite an interesting case. Ultimately, I will admit, during my time as a deputy speaker, I had accepted a few applications with 
the incorrect oath, but we were quickly we quickly changed policy and truly started enforcing the new oath very heavily. Um, and during my brief to the court, I did say um, along the lines that this is the oath that is written into law. The oath is the oath. It does not, it cannot be changed with a qualifier. If we're going to allow a qualifier in, we need to change the entire oath. Because there's going to be some speakers who accept it, some who don't, if the court rules that, yes, you can put a qualifier in, but we don't need to change the law. So what the question then comes along the lines of what qualifies as a qualifier? And I thank the court for saying that one speaker to the next, what defines a qualifier would change, and that cannot it cannot be accepted. Um, so, and I fully believe along the lines that you identify the nation, you say their oath, and then at the bottom, if you'd like, you can say, sign such and such leader of such and such nation, or on be- as the citizen did uh, apply on behalf of his leader, and he identified himself, and then he filled out the oath, that was fine. So, the other part of the ruling was that citizens who had made the incorrect oath for 60 days, they have the potential to no longer be held by that oath. Um, and that the Speaker's office can contact them to let them know that they all have 60 days to renounce that oath um, with no repercussions. Not that there's any repercussions for someone losing citizenship, but they would not... They'd not be held to the standards of the old oath since it was no longer effect and they made it an error and they were granted, granted citizenship an error. But... We are not going to say, oh, you made the wrong oath. We're going to remove your citizenship um, after the fact. So, from there on out, our... The Speaker's Office has been reviewing citizenship records, the spreadsheet, um, citizenship post, application post, um, and reviewing who has citizenship and made the incorrect oath. And we're working to go ahead and start contacting those individuals to make sure that they are aware of their right granted by the court in this matter. Um, So we thank the court for that ruling and for resolving this issue and we want to make sure that everyone is able to fully be aware of what the court's ruling impact is. So on that note, I will talk briefly about what's hap- what else is happening. Currently, we're about to start, or we have started, our judicial elections for court justice. Um, as of right now, there are four people running, a number of other individuals have been nominated. Um, we have Dionium, Iluvatar, Silly String, and Bootsy, all running for court justice. And unfortunately, only three of them can be elected. So how this will play out will be quite interesting, whereas three get it, one doesn't. Um, I think it's a very well-rounded group that are running, and I'll be very interested to see in the uh, results. Um, some might ask, who would you be supporting as spe- as court justice? Um, I think Iluvatar and Silly String have both made a case for being excellent justices. Um, they are engaged. They have helped craft many of the laws that are in effect in uh, the North Pacific and have been very well-spoken, well-mannered about their rulings. Um, they are very fair in the ones that I've read and taken part of, and I think they will continue to do so in the future. Um, so it will be interesting to see how the race plays out and who will eventually be our next set of court justices. 
with that, that is all that I have to talk about today. Um, it has been a pleasure once again talking about TNP, the regional assembly, and a f- short briefing on some happenings around the region. As always, I would like to thank the Ministry of Communications and the Northern Broadcast Service for sponsoring this segment, the Town Hall TNP with Speaker Artemis. I enjoy getting to talk to everyone and giving a little bit of news about what's going on with the Regional Assembly. As always, if you have any concerns with the Regional Assembly, have an idea for bills or ways that you think we can change the region, please feel free to contact us in the Speaker's office and we'll gladly be there to help you out. With that, thank you and have a good evening.